Hello, Mid-American Gardeners. We are glad that you've joined us because this is a beautiful time of the year to be talking about plants and other related things. So we're hoping that you've got some good questions for us and we'll do our best to answer. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in Urbana, Champaign. But three other really talented, intelligent, um, <laughs> Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Panelists are here with me, and I want you to know what their expertise is because they're going to tell you. And then, if you'll gear your questions towards that, that will make it a great show. Now, let's start first with Randy Thornton. Hi there, Randy. Hello. Uh, my expertise, I guess, if you want to call it that, would be uh, landscape, lawn care, uh, somewhat perennials, but uh, just about anything across the board, take a shot at. Uh, I'm with the Vermillion County, Illinois Master Gardeners. It's affiliated with the University of Illinois here, and mm -hmm. uh, be glad to answer your questions. Uh, brought a little thing in today. The plant's really not important to the discussion. I get a lot of questions about uh, names, of all these different names and information on plants. Uh, this particular one, because it's a proven winner, which not to knock them or to promote them, but that's just a marketing program. Uh, there's others out there like Simply Beautiful and so on and so forth. Uh, but this particular one is called Little Henry, and a lot of people think that is the cultivar name. It's not. That is a trademark name relating to the plant material. They're the only ones who could use that name for this particular plant. It's also a, a patented variety, which is called Spritch, which sometimes the same people own trademark own the patent, but not always they can buy. And what the patent does, you can't legally uh, reproduce this plant. If you do it for yourself, are the plant police gonna come arrest you? Probably not, but if you produce these to sell or something, you're definitely gonna have a problem. Uh, the common name for this would be Sweet Spire or Summer Sweet, and then its Latin name would be uh, Itea Virginica. So, I mean, that covers all the different names, but the Little Henry is not a cultivar name. That is a trademark name. All that covers is the name. It, that's just what they wanna call it. It could be called anything else because its actual variety is something called Spritch. So that's Very a little piece good. of Very yeah. good. That was a good primer on that. Because that's <laughs> Yeah, it gets somewhat... confusing. I mean, you almost have to be a lawyer. Like I say, when you get into the reproduction of it and all, as long as you're not doing it for sale or what you're like, say, I don't think the black helicopters are going to come for you or anything. So Well, it it uh, suckers a little bit on its own. Oh, only, sure. So. Yeah, yeah. But most of the plant names you see would be a cultivar. But yes, this most one names would be. Uh, is different. But uh, they would be, and some of them are going to be patented, some aren't. You could even have a non-patented variety sold under a trademark, which you could re you could reproduce it, no problem. You just couldn't sell it under that trademark name. Right. Yeah, like say the Little Henry is a trademark name. You nobody can sell it under that plant name, but these guys. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, very good. Thank you, Randy. And next, we're going to go to Rhonda Furry. Hi, Rhonda. Hi. I'm Rhonda Furry. I'm a horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension. And I cover four counties now, uh, Fulton, Mason, Peoria, and Tazewell, and I'm based out of the Havana office. And I wanna show you one of my favorite new gardening devices. Ooh. It's actually just my smartphone. <laughs> and I use my smartphone, this happens to be an iPhone, but I've also had a Droid, and I use it for many things. I have a magnifying glass on there that I like to use. I have the entire Durr Woody Landscape Manual on here. I use Audubon Wildflower Guides. And my favorite new one is, if you're confused by the names that you just heard about, <laughs> uh, when you look at your plant tag, you see these crazy little symbols on those. And you can download an app called a barcode reader. And all you do is open up that app and then hold your phone over it. Or I, I think there's probably one for an iPad. And if you're connected to the internet, it'll come right up and it'll give you all the information about that plant. And, and so you can do that right out in the garden center while you're shopping. And when you get it home, you can do it right in the garden when you forgot how <laughs> tall it is true. or, That's true. or yeah. what it's yeah. gonna spread. Cause I've seen a lot of people actually gardening or vegetable gardening and they've got their phone out there and checking out that was, that's really fun i think a lot of people will use that yeah. very good thank you rhonda thank you and now the mysterious <laughs> guy next to me is larry shobe hi larry hi i'm larry shobe i'm the grounds gardener for eastern illinois university and uh, i deal a lot in flower shrubs trees and vines and uh, i would like to uh, show you how to propagate plants from layering, which I do quite often. You know, a lot of people may not realize that uh, you can often propagate 
flowers, shrubs, trees, and vines, a certain number in each category, but not everything in those categories. I've brought with me tonight an endless summer hydrangea, and so I'll show you how you can uh, propagate a shrub, at least, and, and a tree uh, often, and by taking this longer branch here that's close to the ground, and generally you want fairly new, new wood, uh, just a year or two old, and then you put that down in the ground. I like to put them down uh, four to six inches where you have good moisture if you're not going to be watering it. And if you do that in the spring of the year or up until the time of maybe early June, they will generally have rooted by winter, and most of them it's best to, to take them off then in, in the spring of the following year. But you don't, the nice thing about layering is you don't really have to water that plant when you layer it down under the ground and leave it attached because it's attached to the stem, the, I mean the main plant of it, the stem is, and you want several inches, a couple inches or so sticking out, out of the ground at least. It'll root faster if you happen to be watering that area and, and flash some water on it during dry periods. But uh, that's a wonderful way to continue heirloom plants or plants mm -hmm. that, that someone would like to have from you. Uh, flowers, often the annual and uh, the perennial flowers may just take a, a very little soil on top of them to get them to root. But the shrubs and trees, you want to put them a little deeper into the ground. And also, you can scar the branch if, if you That's what I was going to gonna ask, to wound but or you, not to wound it. Or but I, I just never do. You and, don't have to. And, and I don't have to. And sometimes I do, so I don't okay. know if it, not all the times, but okay. yeah, it just depends. It's one of my favorite ways of uh, propagating plants. And I'm so glad Larry talked about it, because we, we mentioned layering, but it, really until you see it and then when you try it you realize wow this is easy right a little time consuming and you just don't have to water them all the time and worry easy. about them during dry periods right and that's what's nice about that great well thank you for bringing that You're and welcome. for talking about layering i think that's something that is not done as much as it could be now we have a video mail to show and it's from a viewer who's talking about her plant I have this beautiful plant that I transplanted about three months ago and I water it and I'm getting these bad black dry spots on the leaves and I was just wondering what is causing those and what can I do to remedy them. Thank you. Okay. Now, I didn't see a whole lot of spots, but maybe it's because of our distance, but let's talk about what would happen, why that would happen, just in general. We're going to throw it out to the whole panel. Go ahead. I was going to say, well, first of all, we uh, think that it's a peace lily, a spathophyllum, yes. and typically those peace lilies uh, need a lot of water. So, you know, we were guessing that it may have browning on the edges and it could be water related. Because generally, if a peace lily gets too dry, the tips of them die first, mm -hmm. and maybe the edges a little bit. Uh, for some bulbs and the, uh, and the like, it could be a virus in the bulb itself. I know I've had a, a plant in the greenhouse, I think it was from Africa, it's an African hosta, and it's a bulb as such, and it would unfurl, it would look fine the first day or two, and then the blotches would uh, begin to form and they did on every leaf that came out on that plant. So I, I tend to think that that's either a virus inside or spreading somehow on the outside. You and know what, uh, if it is watering though, uh, they do wilt quicker than everything else mm -hmm. when I'm watering about the same, but you wanna just actually check the soil, get used to it, and you may have to water that a day or two more earlier than your other mm -hmm. plants. The other thing that came to mind is that um, it, it looked like it was outside, and I wondered if maybe it could have some sun burning. That's possible. That's possible, and you have to realize that the soil mediums that you're using are different, mm -hmm. and uh, some of them dry out faster, so you, it's best, like Diane said, that you periodically check the top of the soil with your finger because they may be drying out faster than you realize. I have that problem from mm -hmm. time to time. Mm -hmm. 
But it always dries out before anything else I have mm -hmm. indoors. Right. Yeah. That's not even yeah. talking about outdoors. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, we have um, really a chance for you to get some of your questions answered with the videos. So if we, we, you know, if you want to send it to us, we'd like to see or hear about your garden challenges. So there it is at your garden, your garden at gmail.com. So uh, send those to us and we'll do our best to answer them. And it's kind of fun to see it because half the time we spend all the time trying to identify what the plant is. And when we can see it, that cuts that pretty fast. Now let's go to the phone lines and we're going to start first with line two. And it's a question about fertilizer. Hi there. Hi. Um I've been having real good success with bone meal and blood meal mm -hmm. on my plants. But um, I was wondering, do they give my plants the full spectrum of what they need? And would it be beneficial if I spread it around the roots of some really big trees I have in my backyard? Well, okay. Bone meal and... Uh, what was the other one? Uh, blood blood meal. Blood meal. They're, Thank they're you. both blood excellent meal. organic fertilizers. Uh, and yes, between the two of them, you're covering most of your bases. The blood meal is going to be your higher nitrogen, and uh, the bone meal is going to cover your phosphorus and potassium pretty decent. Uh, the only problem with, as with most uh, organic fertilizers, is it takes quite a bit of quantity to do something like a tree. But if you're doing it every year, uh, or a couple times a year, or however many, uh, yeah, you certainly could do trees. It's just a matter of if you would prefer to stay with that type of thing or, or not. But yes, between the two of them, you're actually covering the bases pretty well. What about a time-release fertilizer? Yeah, uh, yeah. Like I say, I mean, it's just a matter of if you want to stick strictly organic, then yes, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're hitting the hitting them pretty well, so. The bone meal was always used for bulbs. That mm -hmm. was right. just, mm -hmm. yeah. and then they found out that they needed more um, nitrogen, so then the blood meal was put in with it. Oh, okay. And because before they just thought, well, let's get the roots started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. um, it's really just a matter of taste. And in in the mid section of this country, we have very good soils. Now, right. if you have mm -hmm. sandier soils, you're going to have to maybe add more often. Yeah. And in the earlier part so. of the last century, I mean, everything was blood meal That's and right. bone meal. It was a byproduct of the uh, the industry and. So it is recycling. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It's very organic. I've generally had been fortunate and had good soil, so I don't worry about that too much. And that's kind of what I was thinking. I don't do it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah too and I, I mean, I don't worry about the phosphorus and potassium as much, but I am in the sands of Mason County, and yeah. so yes. uh, I do have problems with the nitrogen in particular. It's there, but not very long. Yeah. And, right. and there are other yeah. organic fertilizers out there, too, that if you're really interested, I mean, that are probably might go a little farther, like things like malorganite, chickadee doo doo, sheep <laughs> sheep poo. I don't know what all they're out there. You poo. You poo. That's it. <laughs> but you know, but there's all kinds e of brands out there. W e, of them. <laughs> not you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very Excellent much. Excellent question. Thanks. Thank you so much, because that's a good discussion on organic versus other types. Now we have a hosta question. So let's go to line three. Hi there. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much. I, I have a shade garden, so I have a lot of hosta. And uh, last spring, there was one hosta with a problem. And I didn't really pay much attention to it. But this spring, I have 16 or 18 hosta with problems. The leaves are shiny on the, on the background, on the back of the leaf. Mm -hmm. And they look bubbly. Um, and some of the leaf is almost transparent. Uh, I don't. I don't know what it is. I have taken it into um, a garden center here, and they didn't know what it was. Have you any suggestions? Well, I'm, uh, my first thought is to take it to the plant clinic and have them test it because I know we do have some that problems with hosta uh, recently. Well, that was there, my first thought. You have had problems. There is a viral. Uh, mm -hmm. Hostas have a serious problem with some virus. Uh, do you know your sources for a lot of these plants? Did it start after you planted certain plants or something? No, not yeah. particularly. So the one yeah. it started on was an established hosta? Um, that yes, last it was year? established. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because. If we could get the plant clinic uh, screen up, that would be, um, I think, useful. And, and, and where is the plant clinic? If you'll look on the screen, 
It's there on South Goodwin. That's Turner Hall, right there. 702 on, South Goodwin. And mm -hmm. that's right there on campus. But okay. I would think this is nothing to be messing around with. Right. I wouldn't even no. want to guess. You need to be yeah. careful when you're buying a new plant because you can infect all of yours yeah. with that. Yeah, and hostas, it is a serious problem with them now is where you're getting your plant material because there is some problems out there. Before, even in class, I would tell uh, students, don't make a hosta highway, mm -hmm. and that was because of slugs. But now, with other reasons, <laughs> sure. yeah. you want to have hostas and then break it up. I know some people love hostas, but you're going to love them to death if you don't break them up with things that yeah. won't jump. So I would get that to uh, the... Monoculture, I mean... Monoculture it, it, yeah, yeah. is a problem. We've had it with trees here on campus. Right, mm -hmm. we have and, too. Uh, so I would get that into the plant clinic maybe even tomorrow <laughs> um, and then have but them... But the bubbly, that, that rings a bell there. I, I, I'd be a little concerned, but mm -hmm. need to find out. And transparent. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'll bring I'll bring it in um, within a week. Yes, um, that'd be certainly. Great. I've, I'm obviously doing many things that are incorrect. One of the things is <laughs> not I have necessarily a lot of pasta, and I have been bringing them in both from friends and from um, garden centers. Yeah, but in, not necessarily. Are you doing it incorrectly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've been so fortunate not to have. Major any problem. And Major as problem. a rule, hosta is so, uh, so carefree. I mean, basically, exactly. it's but always it, been it a It may be plant. a trend into the future that you'll really have to watch where you do buy these to make sure that they're clean. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And we may get some more information about it for another show. Mm -hmm. um, oh, all right. Thank you so much. And see if anyone does know a little bit more about that. Thank you very much for your, for your question and concern. Okay, now let's go to another call on line four. It's about a spruce. Hi, um, I have a question about the Colorado blue spruce. Um, I have a few planted at this current time, and I understand that there soon will be a uh, fungus of some kind in our area that will soon be uh, fatal to my trees. And I'm wondering if there's anything that I can do about it to uh, to save them. Um, I'm not aware of anything, but that's well. We've we've had major problems with spruces for the last couple of years, and a lot of that's been our really strange wet weather years that we've had. Uh, but again, I, I would reference the plant clinic that they can culture for um, diseases and, and, and also check out their website because they have an excellent fact sheet on uh, spruce diseases and environmental problems. And I think some uh, urban areas are not allowing people to choose spruces as you a plant because of the disease. You mm -hmm. begin to see more and more of them die where they're clustered. And uh, it may be airborne, or it could be through the roots. You know, the roots of trees go vastly further than their branches. So, but yeah. anytime you can to, go ahead. I wanted to plant more, but uh, the person that I was getting my trees from discouraged that. Right. Because mm -hmm. of this, there are uh, so uh, many beautiful evergreens. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, yes. Now some of them are bigger than spruce yeah. will be, but spruce can be very large. Yeah. I think my windbreak has, I want to say, nine or ten varieties. That's uh -huh. the way to do them because mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. we've had some windbreaks completely die out, but mm -hmm. there were some pines with nematodes and things like that. And there are a few trees that look like evergreens, but they're deciduous. And so that helps too. The bald cypress, a mm -hmm. lot of people often think that they are, they're evergreen, but they're not. And there's some others uh, too. I can't think of the names of them right now. Larch. Larch. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some larch. people have cut their larches down because they thought they were dead. <laughs> and uh, they simply lost their leaves till spring. And so you have to be careful sometimes. And extremely long-lived plants, too. The Don's well, Redwood. The Don's Redwood from China is the same yes. mm -hmm. type mm -hmm. of tree. So now you can do some homework. <laughs> so thank you very much for your... Um, for your call. Now we're going to go to a fun fact and have you learn a little bit more about horticulture. Okay, don't 
forget about beneficial insects. All right, now let's go to our panelists and we're gonna answer some emails from the viewers. And I think we'll start with you first, Randy. Okay, uh, this is a question about uh, apple tree spray and it's pretty short and concise. I was, I was wondering what is the best time to spray apple trees and what spray do you recommend? Uh, basically, on apple trees or any of the fruit trees and so forth, you don't, one thing you do not want to do is spray anytime they're in bloom or even after the, uh, when the buds start to, to uh, pop. You don't want to spray in that time period until after the blooms are gone. The other part of that is, is make sure that you really need to spray. It's kind of back to the organic question. Uh, do you want absolutely perfect apples with no little, absolute, no little spot or anything on them? then yeah, you may want to do a spray program, which there's a lots of fruit tree sprays out there that generally are applied. They're usually an all-in-one product like fungicide, insecticide, and so on. You spray every couple weeks through the season. And then there's also dormant oil, which uh, is generally applied in the winter after the leaves are off or early, early spring before the leaves start to come on or the buds start to open. And that suffocates a lot of insect eggs and uh, scale and that kind of thing on the <laughs> plant. So in general, there are some apple, uh, if you just go to your garden center, there are generally just fruit tree sprays and they're a combination, generally they're a combination product of fungicide, insecticide, and uh, they'll take care of your pro problem. Okay, thank you very much. And now mm -hmm. on to you, Rhonda. Yeah, thanks. I have a question that says weed question mark on it. And uh, this person had received a cutting from a neighbor about 23 years ago and has been growing this plant in a pot, uh, really treating it as a house plant for all these years and is wondering if uh, what it is and wondering if maybe it's actually a weed. And so we uh, oh. looked at the picture and, and the, you can see on the, on the screen there, the picture, um, it's a little hard to tell, but you know, the first thing that came to mind was a Swedish ivy, which is a house mm -hmm. plant, and and you'll also see it uh, available in the garden center for growing, you know, in containers outside and and in uh, hanging baskets sometimes as well. So that's what I'm thinking it might be is the Swedish ivy. And when you said that, the panel went, you know, I think you're right. We were yeah. a little stumped at first, but I think you're right. Good job, good investigative work there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and now Larry for your email. Okay. I have a question about a couple very large fig trees that are taken into the garage in the winter, wrapped in blankets, and then in the spring they're brought out and uh, they do just fine that way. But also, they're w they've gotten so huge that they would like to prune them back and they want to know when to do it and how far back to do that pruning. Uh, the best time to prune them is when you take them out before they uh, actually put that energy into the leaves. And as far as how far to prune them back, uh, those limbs are rather large at the base of it, the main trunk of it. So you don't want to cut off uh, all the little ones. Uh, be sure and leave some small uh, uh, limbs on it and just shape it but leave limbs that have several buds, three or four buds at least, on, on every limb if you can. And then it should uh, do fine, it'll come out, and uh, you might once in a while have to pinch the end of it and let another area of it grow to get, get the shape that you want. It'll send out new buds and you should have, it should be okay. Very good, all right. Well, we wanna to go to line five next. There's a video comment and maybe this person knows the answer. <laughs> so line five. Hello there. Yeah, um, I'm calling about the peace lily. Yes. With the brown leaf tip. I found that a lot of house plants are really highly sensitive to the chemicals in our water, such as That's true. Mm -hmm. And okay. if she would collect the water for a day or two and let the chemicals evaporate before she uses them to water the plant, that that might solve her brown tips on the leaves. That is That's an excellent very, comment. Or even rainwater. Or rainwater. I was thinking the same thing. Because the rainwater has nitrogen in it. <laughs> I remember the first time I visited a friend and she had all these pans of well, not all of them, but two pans of water out in two different rooms and she was doing the same thing. And I always remember that. But we forgot it for this question. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. But rainwater is great, and I do collect yeah. rainwater 
uh, fairly often for my shouldn't house plants. Shouldn't be a problem lately. <laughs> no, that shouldn't be a problem. Of course, that plant could go out during a rain, gentle rain, and come back in. Right. But yes, I think that might be the case. Um, so Definitely. I'm glad we Good took point. that comment because it helps to have more than one mind yeah, on this, uh, right. on the case. Well, my things go fast. It's a re it really <laughs> yeah. the show went fast, but. We learned it's lots fun. of good things too, and yeah. we're all excited here for spring. So um, I don't know, I just think it's fun to have the videos, but we like getting your emails as well as having the panelists bring in show and tell. So thank you folks very much for coming. I'm glad that we got to uh, have so much fun chatting about all our good spring activities. Well, we wanna thank each of you for watching. We know there's a lot to do, but take time to watch our show, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.